God has us right where he wants us. <laughs> Are you feeling it? <laughs> Are you feeling the grace of God with this? Oh, the love of God for you and me is so extravagant. How do we find the words that communicate this outrageous love for somebody like me and for somebody like you? John came close. He tried. He worked on it. I'm sure he wrote this six times over. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. <laughs> is that good news to you? Do you see yourself as a child of God today? I know that when I even say those words... <laughs> In my heart and probably yours too, it was a quick flashback of, oh Lord, how can you love me? I think about the journey, the mistakes, the failures, the doubts, the fears, the garbage that circulates in my soul, accumulated over a lifetime of frustration, disappointment, child things. And he loves us still. And he wants you and me to experience a kind of renewal that stops us from looking at ourselves and looks up to a kind of love that cannot be described with words, but can be experienced in the heart. A kind of transformation begins when the love of God is tasted. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is, come on church, say it with me, is good. Loving one another, John continues in his letter, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Oh, such good words today. I'd like to take you on a brief journey back to the first century. Those who first followed Jesus wanted to share the story of their relationship, their, their, their experience with him. They wanted to share with others. They wanted to connect others to, to, to Jesus. And, to, and, and they knew that by doing that, they needed to bring them into connection with the fellowship. And, that they, and, and like John said, our fellowship is with the Father. And we want to invite you into our fellowship so that our joy might be complete. Oh, come, and see. Just come and see. Come and taste it. Come and experience the joy. But don't look to me. Look to the Father. Listen to the stories. Let's share them together. Let's encourage one another because this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is life eternal. Oh, but it wasn't easy being a disciple maker in first century. Oh, it was difficult. I don't know that it's any less difficult today, but in, in those days there was tension. There was political tension and religious tension. Countries battling one another, nations, ethnicities. There were struggles between the government and the people, between religious following and different kinds of sects. You know, there were so many different sects. S-E-C-T-S, I know that comes out kind of awkward when I say it. Different kinds of sex in first century. I mean, you, you know, some of you know, of course, there were the, the Pharisees. The Pharisees had much control over the, over the synagogues. I mean, wherever 10, 10, peop, 10 men would get together in a community, they could form a synagogue there. But then there were the Sadducees who had much influence and control over the temple. The temple, of course, was kind of like a, uh, a, a general conference and a, and a, and a national government and a, and a spiritual experience, all in the same thing, all, uh, and a cultural center. That was the temple, and the Sadducees ruled it. And then there was a crazy kind of group that said, this is nuts, we cannot live here. And they moved out to the Dead Sea. They're called Essenes. There was about 4,000 of them. I've been to the place where they lived. It's a place called Qumran. 
we, we actually value what they did because they're the ones who put the Dead Sea Scrolls up in some caves that were found back in the 1940s. They existed. There were some amazing people, but they were kind of off because they just never felt right with God. They constantly baptized themselves again and again, wanting to get right, wanting to get clean with God, never really knowing that, that by his grace alone, he declares someone forgiven. Not that we can attain it of our own strength, but we depend upon the mercy of God for being right with God. And then there was a small group, fortunately a small group, called Sakari. Sakari would tuck a dagger inside their coat, and if they had a chance to stick a Roman, they would do it. They were the terrorists of their time. And then there were zealots. Jesus actually invited one of the ze a zealot to follow him. And who, what was his name? I, no, it wasn't Judas. That's close. His name was Simon, not Peter, but Simon. Simon was a zealot. Who were the zealots? Oh, they just wanted to get Rome out of Jerusalem and out of Palestine. They wanted Rome gone. And with these kinds of tensions, with the Roman, what was called the Pax Romana, or the Roman peace, oh, so-called peace, as long as everybody obeyed every rule of Rome, then there was Roman peace. As long as there was that Roman peace, I suppose there was maybe some way of getting along with one another. But if it just contradicted Romans, Rome's ideas, if it went against the government, oh, you wouldn't want to be in that place. Trying to make a disciple in that culture in those times would have been difficult because Jesus himself, his message was a threat to society. I mean, the entire culture pointed toward worshiping emperor in Rome. And if they didn't, there could be trouble. Making disciples in first century was not easy. And yet they tried, they worked on it, they went, they, 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 they gathered in small groups. They didn't have church buildings back then. It took 300 years before they would build church buildings. They met in homes, they met in neighborhoods, they met quietly, they kept discipling and the church grew by the hundreds. I want to take you to where the fire began. It was along the banks of the Jordan River. I want to just move quickly through a couple of scriptures. John chapter 1. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. This fire started in John. John was called a disciple, a disciple maker, if you will. He's one who preached on the banks of the Jordan River. He spoke truth in love. Each, it was his goal to reveal the Messiah coming even though he'd never met him. He wanted to reveal him. He, he preached the messages that God gave him through the Spirit. Jewish leaders were sent. If you're looking in your Bible, it's in John chapter 1 verse 19. Jewish leaders were sent by the priests and Levites and they asked, who, who are you? And he did not fail to confess. I love that part because he didn't fail to say, look, let me just explain it to you. And then he would say, look, I'm not the one you're talking about. I am not the prophet. I'm not Elijah. I'm not, I'm not the Messiah. That's not me. But what I am is a voice, just a voice. And I'll cry in the wilderness if that's what I need to do to prepare the coming of Jesus. John had a prophetic role to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. And I ask you, church, is that relevant today? Is the church of God today called to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus? I believe it is. So the fire continued. They asked him, no, I'm not the prophet. Just one. John 1, 14, backing up just a little bit. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. 
the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. This is the one they wanted to tell about. This is the name they wanted to share. This is the one that they walked with, spent time with, put their hands on, heard his words, experienced love, touched by his mercy and grace, confronted in their sin, and he loved them anyway. He walked with them. He invited them to follow him. They learned his ways. They learned that he was always true, always good in heart, always faithful, and willing to confront sin, and willing to confront leadership when it was wrong, willing to confront the the Pharisees or the Sadducees or those that... they, They loved him because they knew that he spoke to their hearts about truth and grace, that fire, friends, started on the banks of the Jordan. Christians today have a, have a similar opportunity to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. What started on the banks of the Jordan became a flame as Jesus began his ministry, as he went from place to place, And when he rose from the grave, when Jesus came out of that tomb, there was no stopping it because they knew they were trusting in one that not only could heal and help and bless and forgive, but could transform life, raise the dead. This is only God with us. It can be nothing else. It is God with people. We do well to dwell upon the significance of God with people. I like what Henry Blackaby says in his book, Experiencing God. That when we're reading his word and we sense something powerful coming from that word that speaks to us personally, I believe he's right when he says, in that moment, wherever you are, you are experiencing God personally because the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and that flesh in Jesus is still the word and the word speaks to our hearts, a word of truth, a word of goodness, a word of grace. So the fire crossed over from neighbor to friend, from friend to village, from village to town, from nation to nation. And the word of God has crossed continents and the word of God has crossed oceans. And this is the flame that still goes. But we're still dependent. God still is calling you and I, believers everywhere, to continue to connect people to him, to continue to disciple John chapter 2, verse 32. John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven and a dove remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize told, with water told me the one in whom the Spirit comes down and remains is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I have testified that, God is, that this is God's chosen one. John reports that the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look or behold, the Lamb of God. And when these two disciples heard him say this, they followed him. And Jesus turned around and said, what do you want? And they said, where are you staying? Oh, they wanted to know. You see, John was preparing them. This is an amazing part of discipleship here. John had been preparing them. They were learning about the Messiah. They were learning about truth. They were learning about holiness. They were learning about sin. They were learning about salvation. But what's amazing to me about this story is these two men, Andrew and likely John, spend one day with Jesus, just one day. And all they can do, all they can think about is they've got to go tell somebody. They've got to go tell somebody. And Andrew, the very first thing he does is run to his brother, Simon, and says, we have found the Messiah. (laughs) And I can imagine Peter, after reading about Peter through all the Gospels and the letters, I can imagine Peter said, what are you talking about? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm... 
taking a little liberty here, okay? He, he, he didn't say that. I don't know if he said that. But I do know that one of their friends, Philip, Jesus met Philip, and Philip said, come with me. Let's, let's, let's go. Let, let's go somewhere. And Philip goes to his friend Nathaniel and says, we have found the Messiah. And Philip said, you're crazy. No, not quite those words. But he did say this, can any good thing come out of, come on church, Nazareth? Can any good thing come? I mean, wow, talk about cynical, huh? <laughs> wow. That's not an easy heart to get through. Are you up for it? Who do you know who is cynical as it gets? And so what are you talking about, Christianity? What are you talking about? Oh, just come and see, he said. Just come and see. And Nathaniel came and became a follower and became later an apostle of Jesus because he invited him to come and see. And the fire flamed from one person to another, from one village to another. John had prepared them to meet the Messiah. Andrew and John connected with Jesus, and Andrew connects with Simon, and Philip connects with, he connects with Nathaniel, and before you know it, there's a disciple-making thing going on, a fire that was building. I mean, it's a beautiful thing when people meet Jesus and want to share Jesus with someone else. I've seen it many times. Uh, someone becomes a follower of Jesus. They come out of the water, and within a week or two, they say, they're thinking, who, who can I share this with? <laughs> who can I share this with? Indulge me for a moment. I'll take you on a little journey. Back in my early 20s, I was not yet married, but dating Carolyn. Carolyn came from a tribe of faith different than my own. Although I had some Seventh-day Adventist roots, I never committed my life to Jesus. But through an amazing set of circumstances we don't have the time to go into here, I began to ask Carolyn some questions. I, would do you think, I said, spirituality is important for a marriage? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And she said, okay. I said, well, um, how do we do this? And she said, well, I'll tell you what. We're not going to go to your church, whatever that was, and we won't go to my church. We'll find one together. I said, okay, but I chose the Bible studies. <laughs> so we began studying the Bible week after week at my house. We'd meet on a Wednesday night or a Thursday, and we'd study the scriptures. We'd open up these little pages from a book called Your Bible and You. Anybody ever heard of it? It's an old-timer book. Literature evangelists used to sell it. We'd go through the questions. And then there was this lesson about the Sabbath. And I remember, I will long remember Carolyn saying, where are we ever going to find a church that goes on Saturday? <laughs> I said to her, well, I think I know one. And then she said, don't tell me. I said, I can't help it. It is. I mean, so it's a Wednesday night, that following Sabbath, we were in church, 1980, first week in January, and we've never stopped. We've never stopped. And I'll tell you one of the reasons we didn't stop, because the head elder, I'm sitting in the front pew, okay, I'm sitting, no, I'm sitting in the back pew of this little church shaped almost like this one, but much smaller. And I remember sitting there next to Carolyn, and the elder was preaching on angels. I mean, I thought it was the pastor, but it was the first elder, and it was a good sermon. I just remember it being about angels. He comes off the platform, and he comes over, and he shakes my hand. I stand up. His name was Randall, and I said, Randall, I need to be baptized. I thought he would pass out. They hadn't had a visitor there in eight months. Randall and his wife, Pat, invited us to their home. They invited us to their home every Sabbath for three and a half months. Are you kidding me? Who does that? We learned about Jesus there. We learned a lot of things there. He introduced us to his pastor. His pastor did a seminar. 
we attended the seminar, we got baptized. I was still, I didn't know much at all. Not much at all. But at that time, my parents, my siblings, three of my siblings, none of us were in the church prior to this. Not one. There was a time when the whole family packed into the 1963, sorry, 1963 Galaxy 500 and off to church we would go. I remember those days. But nobody was in the church up to that point. And the first thing I wanted to do was, I, I, I got, how am I going to tell my parents I'm, I'm getting baptized? Well, we had to figure out a way. Carolyn's kind of creative. And so we were doing some crafts, and we made this little, took a little piece of pine board about this big, and we took a file and kind of scalloped the edges around it. And then we took a church bulletin, one of these church bulletins, and we laid it on top of the board. And then we took what's called, I think it's called decoupage. Is that, is that, a, is that a word? Anybody know that word? I see some nods. We put some decoupage on top of this thing. It's kind of clear coated this thing and put a little thing on it so it could hang. And we gave it to them for Christmas. We gave it to my parents for Christmas. And it was a message paraphrased from Isaiah, and it said, come back and be at peace, thus says the Lord. That plaque hangs in my parents' dining room this day. They're both 93 years old, and that hangs in their room. Dad comes back to faith. Mom came back to faith. Dad got rebaptized. Mom didn't really need to, but Dad got rebaptized. Dad later becomes a deacon, and later becomes an elder, and later becomes the first elder of the church. And they've been faithful all these years. My sister came back. We're still praying for my brothers. Oh, the desire of a believer is to connect, bring people to Jesus, to be a witness, to, be, to just somehow figure it out. I know that it's not easy because sometimes in, our, in the way we relate, it's difficult and people get turned off or maybe like, what happened to you? What happened to you? I remember that was, I was, uh, before that, or during that time, actually, I was a pipe welder. Pipe welder. Any welders here? I was a pipe welder on a nuclear plant uh, that was under construction in a little place called Berwick, Pennsylvania. And um, the word was getting around, I don't know why or how, but the word was getting around that Tim is getting religious. I'm not sure about that word, but anyway, the word was getting around. In fact, my foreman, his name was Bob, and he was no help. I mean, he was rather a critic. It was not easy. That, I mean, it was just tough. But there was one day I'm on the, on the, up on a scaffold. I'm laying on my back, and I'm welding the bottom side of a pipe, and somebody climbed up on the ladder. And the guy that was climbing up on the ladder, his name was Ron. Now, Ron, I'd never really had a conversation with him, but for some reason, two years earlier, when I saw that he was hired, I had some kind of an attitude for this guy. Now figure that one out. I had an attitude for this guy, and I never even spoke to the man. But it's like, I, w I was like jealous or despised. I don't know what it was. I mean, does that ever happen? Am I the only one that happens to? You look at somebody, and you judge them immediately. Well, that was me, judging Ron. And then I see his head come up above the scaffolding. First, I was a little bit angry, because I hear him trying to weld, and he's shaking the scaffolding while he's climbing up. He pokes his head over the top of the ladder, and he says, hey... I said, yo. <laughs> and he said to me, I understand you know something about the Bible. I said, well, I, uh, I know a little bit about the Bible. I'm, I'm just learning. Can we talk? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, lunchtime. So we get together at lunchtime. Oh, several days a week, we're getting together for lunchtime, just talking. There was a moment when I actually began the courage to pray for him. Wow, that was a big step. A couple of guys with hard hats, you know. You know what I'm talking about? We're sitting on a construction site inside a nuclear power plant under construction, and I'm praying for him, and he's like starting to pray too. 
And it's like I didn't know how to move this forward. I was so ignorant. I didn't know the first thing about listening, discipling. I didn't know anything about this. All I knew is I was falling in love with Jesus. I was becoming part of a church family that I loved. I was just becoming a different person. I was about to get married. And good things were happening in my life. And I just wanted to share. And it's like, so I handed him one day this pamphlet that today I might reflect differently on whether that was the right move. I don't know because it had all kinds of images on it <laughs> that were rather startling. He takes this thing home, and on Monday morning, he comes back, and when we get together for lunch, he said to me, where do you go to church? I hadn't said anything about that up to that point. And I told him the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Orange Street. And he said, well, when are the services? I said, Jed, only we have a Bible study time, and then we have a church service. And then we gave him the times. And he said, can anybody come? Well, yeah. Isn't that what we do? I mean, yeah, of course. Ron lived in another town where there was a closer church to his home. He went to that church eventually, met the pastor there, and was baptized. His wife was baptized. His in-laws were baptized. Altogether, eight people from that little conversation joined God's church. I'm just amazed when, when connectivity happens in God's church. It is a beautiful thing. And you know what? It doesn't depend upon my intelligence. Amen. It doesn't depend on how well I understand the Bible. Amen. What it depends upon is whether or not I have an interest in somebody else a heart for somebody other than me. And the agenda is not about what I'm going to get out of it or how smart I am, but maybe even showing a little more interest in somebody else than, in, than, 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 my, than about me. Finding out who they are and what they care about and what's important to them. And before you know it, you understand a little bit of their family life. And next thing you know, we're praying for them. Friends, I can't tell you that it's always been amazing like this throughout my life, but there's just, there are some amazing high points. There's there's some stories that, I don't know if it's worth, if we have time even here, but just times when I've just gotten outside of myself and had conversation with somebody else. Okay, so I, we decided to have a little, um, I, was at, I was pastoring at uh, the Forest Lake Church in, in Orlando area. I was an associate pastor, and I believed at that time we needed some affinity groups affinity group groups people that have things in common and so I was listening and trying to figure out who knew what at, at Forest Lake Church and uh, one day I hear a guy uh, talking about how he loved to go kayaking I said oh really cool uh, do you go with people he said yeah sometimes we get with friends and we have a condo out by New Smyrna Beach and I said oh great I said what do you say we uh, put something together he said okay um, let's pick a date. We picked a date. We put it in the bulletin. People thought that was kind of odd that we were, this, this goes back a few weeks, okay? But I thought that was a little odd that I was promoting this, this kind of event. But anyway, the idea was to go to the house, the condominium, drop off some food, and then bring your kayak or canoe over to the launch place, and then we ventured out. We had a great time. And guess what day of week this was on? Come on. This was on Sabbath morning. See, that's the rub for some. This was on Sabbath morning. So we take this group. Guess what? 25 people showed up. It's like, I, had no, I thought we were going to be like six. 25 people showed up at the condo. And the next thing you know, we're out there on the water. We're going different directions. We gather back. We have this lunch. There was no room hardly in the, in, the, in the living room there, in the dining room area. There was almost no room for everybody. We're sitting on the floor. We're all over the place. And we finished eating. And I sat there on the floor and led a Bible study. We had worship. We sang some songs. We prayed together. It was, a, it was just a beautiful worship. Later that week, someone who was there, a physician who had been at that church for 14 years, he said, I've been a part of this church for this many years, and this is the first time I've ever experienced anything like this. Please keep going. I was like, wow. Wow. 
Unfortunately, I got called to another church about that time. <laughs> but those groups keep going. We started a motorcycle club. <laughs> Anybody got a bike here? Come on, come on, fess up. Anybody got a bike? So, there's a biker over here. We got a biker. I didn't have a bike. I didn't have a motorcycle. But John had one, and Bonnie had one, and, um, and Mark had one, and, uh, and, and our veterinarian had one. And I said, hey, why don't you guys get together and ride? And I remember John, he said to me, you get your endorsement, and we'll start a club. So I went to get my endorsement, and he said, not only that, but I'll make sure you have a bike every time we go out. So he let me ride his Road King while he rode his Goldwing, and we started a club. And before you know it, we had 17 people riding out on a Sunday morning for breakfast together. And of course, I would always make a speech before we go. I'd get up on a wall by the church, and I'd say some words about God's goodness and, and riding high on the high places. I will long remember the day when I started a bike club at another church. I was fueling up my bike. I'd finally gotten one right before we went over to the church to meet. So I'm putting the gas in. There's a bike two pumps over, a guy and his wife. His name is Bonnie and Rick. And they were filling up their tank. And I'm, I'm, I'm going through this. Should I ask them? Should I go talk to them? You know that thing where you waffle in your head? Should I say something? Should I invite them? Should I invite them to church? Should I invite them to some meeting? You know, should, you know that drill where you're, like, you have, you're having these thoughts? I finally overcame the garbage, and I walked over to the pump, and I said, Hey, my name's Tim. How about you? He said, My name's Rick. And I said, um, Are you riding with a group, or are you going out by yourselves? And he said, Well, we were going to go by ourselves. And I said, Well... I'm meeting with a group in a couple of minutes right down the road, and, you know, you're welcome to come. Would you like to join us? And he said, well, let me talk to Bonnie about it. And so I went back and finished filling up my tank. He came over and said, we'll join you. Wow, okay. So he follows me over to the church. Meanwhile, hey, guys, somebody's coming. And, and, and I roll in, and he rolls in after me, and the guys, the gals that were the bikers, you know, they're wearing leather and all that stuff, okay? It's fun. It's kind of crazy fun. So they gathered around together, and they met Bonnie and Rick as though they were long-lost friends. I mean, just gathered right around them. And before anybody could say a word, I said, hey, Bonnie, Rick, we like to pray before we go. Dear Lord, I didn't give a med a, not even a fraction of a second to do anything other than pray with us. So we went to a restaurant. The restaurant happened to have a huge table, and we all sat around this huge table. All of us, like 10 or 12 people all around this huge table. And I remember the meal. I remember it well because Rick spoke up. He said, you guys do this all the time. I mean, we're at the church. I mean, it's a church group, obviously. Uh, yeah, we like to do it once a month, third, third Sunday. Um, can anybody, like, uh, come along? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. You want to join us? And every week we would pray before we go. It was probably four months later. Because those prayers would include prayer requests, you see. Four months later, Bonnie said, Would you be willing to pray for my daughter? She's in the hospital. She delivered a baby eight months ago. The baby's still in the hospital. Oh, are you kidding? Oh, we just love these people, kept loving these people. Now, church, I'm, I'm telling you these stories because I can't think of one of them where I was giving a Bible study, at least not one in written form. But I hope I was showing Jesus. I think our group was showing Jesus. I like this principle that God does not depend upon you or me to give someone else the complete package of Christianity, especially in one conversation. It's, it's been my mistake of the past to be like a dump truck, backing up against someone and, and giving them the whole load of what I believe. That doesn't work in their benefit and usually embarrasses the disciples. Maker, 
I like what Kim Johnson says in a book that he wrote many years ago. Kim Johnson is an amazing guy. I still have my original pamphlet. It's, uh, it's called, I'm Allergic to Witnessing. <laughs> have you ever seen this? This is amazing. I'm Allergic to Witnessing. In chapter three, I want to share with you, can I share with, could just a couple of points with you? Imagine this now, a line that starts with 0% right here, 0%. And over here is 100%, 100%. Zero represents no interest in spiritual things, no interest in God, or no interest in Christianity, okay? Over on the other end represents 100% I'm all in. Now, what's beautiful about this illustration is that God does not depend upon me or you to get somebody from here to here. What he's asking us to do is to be like a, a link in a chain of events. And maybe for illustration's sake, maybe there's a hundred links from here to here. And God wants me in a given moment or time to be one of those links. To be one of those links. And you never know where you're going to show up on somebody's timeline. Their spirituality might look like they are here, but in reality, they're here. It's also possible that it looks like they are here, but they are way over here. You never know who you're talking to. You never know who's listening to you or watching you. The point is that, that Kim Johnson wants to make it, it, is that we can be one of those links and we help someone move from one link to another by loving deeds, loving acts, loving them well. He brings out several points. One of them is the biggest lesson. He says, I don't have to be all the links in the chain. <laughs> you know, the pressure comes off. The urgency comes off. You know, I can just be me and not be so stressed out as to whether or not I'm going to be able to save their soul. Maybe God has all the links lined up. He's just waiting for me to get mine in. <laughs> and that might be, hey, you want, to go for a, you want to go for a walk? You want to go for a ride? You want to join our whatever? You want to come to our health um, ministry? You want to lose 10 pounds with me? Uh, Whatever, you know, anything, anything that relates with people. Evangelism is a process, secondly. Thirdly, I should relate to people according to where they are on their spiritual line. We've mentioned that. Every link is important as every other link. Every link is important. I'm reminded, friends, that I don't have to be all of these things. I don't have to be all these links. I don't have to have all those things together. What I do need to do, though, is prepare my own heart for being the kind of person that will awaken grace in someone else. And that might mean being gracious or giving or sharing. God's timing is amazing. And He includes us in some strategies that only in the mind of God could it be put together and fulfilled. His timing is, is, is just outrageous. I'll tell you a quick story. It's happened a month ago, not quite a month ago. You're probably following the news about Ukraine, right? Well, I'm, a, I'm acquainted with a friend, a friend who is very much involved in a ministry called No Child Hungry. My friend was in the Miccosukee RV camp in South Florida. And he invited us to visit. So Carol and I, we drive there. We're out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, nowhere. And it's Saturday night, and we are sitting in their RV, having a nice time, and my friend Glenn gets a phone call. It's from William. William is the guy who started No Child Hungry. William has a way of packing meals. Have you ever done that? Pack meals? I mean, you get in a line on a table and you put in little ingredients and somebody at the end of the row seals the bag, they put it in a box, they ship the box. I mean, you pack hundreds. You pack thousands. And in this case, William called Glenn and said, we're thinking about packing meals for Ukraine. This is three weeks ago. We're going to pack. We think we can do this. With one week's preparation, 
He said, we want to do this in Orlando at the City of Destiny Church. Okay? I'm listening to half of this congregation, or the conversation. And then I said to Glenn, I said, Glenn, do you think Florida Conference could be of help here in any way? He puts me on speakerphone. And William heard this and said, absolutely, get, get as many people as you can. We're going to need it. They made a commitment that night that if they could pull it off, they want to pack a million meals. A million meals in one day. This is like, how does that happen? You're going to need a thousand people to get that done. I mean, they've done this before. They do the math. They know how it works. He's got the equipment. He's got all that stuff, but he's going to take shipping food from the Midwest. It's going to be shipping the things that they have to do the bins with and all the heaters and all that, back, all that stuff. And on, on Friday evening, on Friday evening, some started gathering. The tables were already set up. That night, they packed about 80,000 meals. I was there. The next morning, Sabbath morning, it's 920. Already there was 150 or 200 people packing meals. We didn't even wait. People started showing up. The room, their whole sanctuary, they cleared all the chairs out of the sanctuary on their carpeted sanctuary. There was food all over this place. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they'd only packed 500,000 meals. This was a problem. I said, Glenn, do you want me to call? You want me to call in for reinforcements? He said, let me check. At that time, at that very time, Forest Lake Academy, our academy there in Orlando, had a, I don't know how they found out about it, but they found out about it, and they showed up in force along with a whole bunch of pathfinders. I mean, a whole bunch of pathfinders. They filled that room up. They had to go over to the gym to pack more meals. We started packing meals like crazy, and by 6 o'clock... Ten minutes after six, they announced that we had packed over one million meals. And I heard, the, I heard William come back and he said, he said, your people, meaning Seventh-day Adventists, he said, it would not have happened if your church did not show up. He said, when the, when the Pathfinders and the Academy kids showed up, he said, it was like the cavalry came. <laughs> this is amazing. Why do I tell you that story? Because when you can invite someone to an experience like that, and the experience itself will transform them. They stop looking at me and they see what's happening in the room. I could tell you more about that event. God's timing is the purpose of that. Friends, I rearranged my schedule to three weeks in the future so that Carolyn and I could be at their RV. We had to rearrange our schedule. And if I had not been there at that time, I would not have been able to offer our conference support. I mean, we went out to all of our employees, all of our entities, and they showed up. I'm, t I'm saying this because God's timing is amazing. It also takes a will to say, we can do this. And if we can't find a way, we'll figure it out. Amen. And the rest of that is that a very, uh, very well-known food packing company volunteered a plane to take the food to Ukraine. That fell through. It fell through. And, a, and less than a week later, UPS, yes, your UPS driver, that company, they showed up and said, we'll do it. And they did it for no charge. No charge. And not only that, they said, you want to pack some more meals? We'll give you another flight. They were struggling as to how to get the food to Ukraine. They said, well, maybe just Poland because, you know, we just can't get into the Ukraine. Well, the news just came back later this week that the food is now going by car and van and small vehicle into Ukraine, helping the people. Well, friends, when, we, when the church gets engaged in these things, life happens. I say this too because discipleship must happen on multiple levels. It's not becoming a good person only in the pew. I respectfully say that. You see, the strength of a church is not its seating capacity. The strength of a church is its sending capacity. We gather to praise the Lord and worship Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but let it be the, the fire that engages me 
and you and friends and family to start small groups, to do things in the community, to join maybe other organizations, to make discipleship happen. This is how we grow. This is how we serve. And along the way, we get the privilege of mentoring people. Oh, God is in it, friends. God is in it. It's his church. And he wants to see us engaged and enjoying the mission as he's created it, as he's called us to it. I love what Dale Carnegie says. Years ago wrote this. You'll, and this is about engaging with people. He writes, you'll accomplish more in two months by developing sincere interest in two people than you'll ever hope to accomplish in two years trying to get people interested in you. <laughs> Profound. My goal is not to get people interested in me or my church. I need to be interested in them. And when that happens, it's when they start asking questions. Well, who are you anyway? Oh, well, let me tell you. And that's when the fire moves from one soul to another. And God is doing his thing. And we step back and say, Lord, this is yours. I know it's yours. I know you're doing this. You're doing this thing again. And you give us the privilege to be a part of it. Oh, what beauty. Mother Teresa put it this, this way. Comparing East and West, India to America, or the Western world, the greatest disease of the West is not tuberculosis or leprosy, which of course were the elements of India. It is being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. Oh, that we would be the church that he's called us to be. Lastly, friends, let us take the words of Jesus personally. Not just corporately, but personally. He looked into a crowd of maybe 15,000. I can only imagine how he had eye contact with his disciples and others that were gathering on that day on the mountain. And he said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He's teaching us not to depend upon organizations and systems. They're all important. Things don't get done without them. But the best things happen not needing a budget or a building, but needing a heart in which Christ is formed. May God bless you as you advance this year through connecting and growing and serving and mentoring. And may you have the joy of Jesus as you go.